Hi, I'm John Corkin, Executive Director of the American Road Society. So glad you're joining us on this Saturday. I hope you're having a wonderful one. It's a little wet out here at the American Rose Center, but we're having a blast pruning roses. Um, I will thank you uh, for everything, and I will hand it over now to Kim Merritt so she can go over how everything's going to go today. Thank you, and have a good day. Thanks, yeah. John. Thanks, John. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we'll have a wonderful presentation on chemical safety by Mr. Craig Dorschel. But before we get into that, uh, we will have uh, Dave Mahoney that will be giving you some important information. And uh, then he will introduce Mr. Andy Venable, who will then introduce Mr. Dorsho. Uh, as usual, if you guys are watching this seminar with someone else, please make sure you're posting in chat who you're watching with. That way we can make sure we're noting your attendance properly. Not sure where the chat pod is. It's over to the right at the bottom of the screen, and you'll see chat. Yes, can you hear me? You can type hey, your you you hit the mute button. Can I can I bug you for five minutes? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Right, give me just a second. There we go. <laughs> sorry about that, you guys. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with the seminar. And Dave, go ahead. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we're down to the last portion of this chemical safety, which is the last part of the CR school. Uh, sometime later this evening, I'll probably get the attendance report for all the candidates. And as soon as I get that and I check everybody off, I will be sending out an email to all of the candidates with a link to the test. The test will be open from 12 01 a.m. Monday through 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday. So it's a little over 48 hours. Uh, if you do not get a link sometime before 9 o'clock tomorrow evening, please send me an email at crnet at cox.net so that I can send you another link. I know there are a couple people who are going to be delayed in when they're going to take the test, so don't worry about it if you don't get one, or if you get one and you don't need it quite yet, or you're working or something along that line, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll catch up with that later, but send me an email if you need a link. Other than that, I think we're all set to go. I'd like to introduce to you a member of the CR, CR National Advisory Committee. Um, and his name is Andy Vanderbilt. Along with being on the advisory committee, Andy is the district CR chair for the Yankee District. And Andy, go ahead. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where in the world you are. Craig Dorschel is a master Rosarian and Yankee District Outstanding Consulting Rosarian for 2011. He is a chemist by profession and has a doctoral degree in organic chemistry. He has served as district director for the Yankee District and is currently regional director for Region Zero. Craig grows about 150 roses at his home in Massachusetts and is a member of the New England, Connecticut, and Rhode Island Rose Societies. He is past president of the New England Rose Society and is currently National Chairman of Arrangement Trustees. Welcome, Craig, and thank you for presenting here today on chemical safety for our members in attendance. Craig? Thanks, Andy, and before I proceed, uh, is everyone seeing the title slide and are you seeing me? Yes, we can. Andy or somebody? Okay, great. I'll go ahead then. Let me try this again. There we go. Uh, the presentation includes some uh, photos from a previous one that was uh, made by Steve Jones. There may be a bit of his text in there as well, so I do want to acknowledge that. 
And also for the candidates for the exam, hash mark marks the spot. That's something you should pay particular attention to. You've been warned. I do, however, commend you check and to everyone uh, the chapter eight in the latest Consulting Rosarian Manual. I, I think it deals with the topic in an excellent fashion and it's a source of a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, but you'll see there's some extras in here as well. So, as in, you might've been asked in high school, what is a chemical? Well, a chemical is everything made up of chemical elements, anything and everything. And it's these things, right? You used to see that on the classroom wall. So that includes all animals, all vegetables, all minerals, all matter. And that includes us. So that's a rather broad topic. Chemistry is a study of matter. But we're gonna narrow it down today to a, a small subset that we call pesticides. And what are pesticides? Well, that includes insecticides, and you notice the C-I-D-E means you're trying to kill something. <laughs> so insecticides, they're to kill insects, fungicides to kill fungi, miticides to kill mites, herbicides to kill plants, <laughs> uh, rodenticides to kill those pesky mice, voles, et cetera, that sometimes trouble us, molluscicides for snails and slugs, and these are all intended to be toxic to their targets, less so, but maybe toxic to us too. So that's what we're concerned with today is the how to use these products safely and effectively. So I like to start with what I call toxicology 0.1. How do I understand what toxicity is? Where do I find information? And we'll start with a little interlude about the metric system and you'll see why I'm doing this uh, shortly. Here's a list of the nations not officially using the metric system. It includes Liberia, Myanmar or Burma, the United States of America, and that's all. Okay, but the metric system is used universally in science and medicine and even in some industries like beverages. If you have probably noticed that you buy your soft drinks, uh, wine and liquor by liter or the fraction or multiple thereof these days, rather than in quarts or pints or four fifths of a quart or anything of that sort. I think that's because since most of the world is on the metric system, they don't like to maintain two different sizes of containers or bottling lines and whatnot. So here are some equivalents to keep in mind. A gallon is about 3.8 liters. A liter consists of 1,000 milliliters. A tablespoon is, is about 15 milliliters, close enough for government work, which means a teaspoon would be five milliliters approximately. There are 1,000 grams in a kilogram. There are 1,000 milligrams in a gram. And 450 grams add up to be just about a pound, which means that a milligram is one one thousandth of one one four hundred and fifty fourth of a pound, which is not very much. It's basically just a speck of something. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, for some, the slide isn't moving, and it's not moving for me either. Your presentation. I'm oh not dear. sure if it's frozen. No, it's not. It's coming down on mine. Are you still, are you seeing anything? In... Looks like most of the folks in chat are still seeing slide number one. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and start again. How about now, do you see equivalents? PowerPoint as of yet. Okay, I'm seeing something that says pause, and I don't know how to unpause that. I believe you hit it again, and it'll unpause it, Craig. Okay, I'm going to show. Yeah, show. 
And I hit it again, it still says paused. Okay, let's just reset you really quick. Let's see. Sorry, right, well, we're going to get started here in just a moment, just a technical, technical difficulty. One second. Okay, you're not showing anything. Okay, I'm gonna make you the presenter again, Craig. Okay. Can you try it again now? Yep. Okay, I'm showing, I'm seeing a pause symbol on, on the show. And, and then it came up. Are you seeing anything? No, I'm seeing a white screen. Yeah, it's a white Boy, never had there this you trouble. Go. Equivalence is up now. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm I'm sorry about that. Greg, try going back one and then come just to see if we work everything's working. Yeah. Okay, so Yeah, there you go. So here we were. I don't think you missed anything on the slide you slide you didn't see, but anyway, here we are. And here's the equivalence. I just said that a milligram was one one thousandth of one hundred one four fifty fourth of a pound. So okay, a kilogram was about two point two pounds. Next, here's a quote that you hear a lot, and nerd that I am, I'm giving it to you in the original Latin and then the translation. Solo dosis paci venom. Only the dose makes the poison, and that was put down by a fellow named per who called himself Paracelsus, who flourished in the first half of the 16th century, so 500 years ago. Uh, this is all about dilution and the effect of that, but where he was coming from, he was an alchemist, he was a physician, he was a polemicist, and he had some pretty good polemics, believe me. But he had, he concluded on the basis of fairly specious logic that things that were poisonous in some amount might possibly be beneficial in much smaller amounts. And he actually managed to successfully treat some diseases, some infectious diseases with very small amounts of things, cringeworthy things like mercury and arsenic. It, that sounds pretty terrible to us nowadays, but he is considered the, the father of chemical therapeutics. So the whole idea is, is that something which can be very dangerous in one amount and high dilution may not be so dangerous. So we want to keep that in mind. And that leads us to the concept of the LD50. So what is LD50? That's the lethal dose of something required to when given all at once to kill 50% of an affected test population. And that's an accepted measure of toxicity and relative toxicity of one to another. And that's expressed as milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Hence all this talk about the metric system because it's not grams per pound, it's milligrams per kilogram. And as a result of that, the lower the number is, the more toxic the substance is. And it takes a small number of milligrams to kill you as opposed to a large number of kilograms to kill you. Uh, the test subjects are most often rats or mice. The, uh, I should say unfortunate rats or mice. Uh, they're not terribly close to human beings, but they're about as close as we really want to subject to this kind of uh, experiment. 
And typically, these are doses that are fed to the test uh, animals. So keeping all of that in mind, here's some LD50 figures for insect, uh, insecticides. Diazinon, about 250 milligrams per kilogram. Diazinon, as you know, is no longer on the market, so it gives you something of a marker. SFA, which is better known as orthene, less so, it's 700 milligrams per kilogram. Stinky old malathion is a gram of 1.4 grams per kilogram. Isulfaton, this is also, I hope, off the market for a very good reason. This was in a combination fertilizer insecticide product that was to be applied to the ground. And there's a noisy microphone somewhere. Uh, Disulfaton is applied to the ground and taken up by the plant as an insecticide, but the problem with that is it's very, very toxic, 2.3 to 6.8 milligrams per kilogram. Nasty stuff. And I heard about accidents with uh, dogs digging up around a, a treated plant and being poisoned, so good riddance to that. Uh, all of these are organophosphate nerve agents. So you could say that they're related to nerve gas, but just for the record, oh, one more, parathion, that's, that's maybe used in bulk agriculture, but that's another nasty one, 3.6 to 13. But a real nerve gas like serum is 172 micrograms per kilogram. So while these things are in, in the same general family, they're not nearly as toxic as real nerve gas, thank God. Uh, among some others, imidacloprid is an example of the neonicotinoid class. Uh, that class has become quite controversial because of the possibility of bees being affected by any residual non-lethal doses in, in the plant. But that comes in at about 430 for rats, 131 for mice, kilogram, milligrams per kilogram. And I say it's a darn shame that this possible problem with the bees exists because uh, this is generally safe for, to handle. And you say, well, that's not that much less toxic than diazinon. But the thing of it is, is that it's so extraordinarily toxic to insects when, when they get a direct hit with it that uh, you use very little by comparison. The, the concentrated form of malathion that you would buy was typically 50%, so half of what was in the bottle was malathion. You might put a tablespoon of that in a gallon of water to spray. Uh, for imidacloprid products, you put a tablespoon of that in a gallon of water, but it was only 1.75% to start with, so that's just how much more potent it is to insects, and using less of it makes it less of a hazard to uh, the applicator. In other words, the, the dose makes the poison, and there's much less of it around. Cyplothrin is an example of a synthetic analog of pyrethrin. You, this is seemingly taking the place of the neonicotinoids now in a lot of the products we see, that and, and others of that type, like permethrin. That's about 500 to 800 milligrams per kilogram. Now, one, one place where I disagree with what's in chapter eight of the manual is they, they give a figure of about 70 milligrams per kilogram for the natural pyrethrins, which is a product coming from a, a type of chrysanthemum. Uh, I think that number is too low. I did some research on that, and I think that number might be more related to uh, injecting it into the test animal rather than feeding. And in terms of a feeding study, I think it comes in at about 700. So the synthetic and the natural product are about equal in uh, overall toxicity. Uh, Azadiractin is the active ingredient of neem oil something you should consider. And it's pretty non-toxic, about three and a half uh, grams per kilogram for azadiractin. The neem oil would be a little less so because the oil is going to dilute it and the exact figure would depend on exactly how much azadiractin was in a given sample of neem oil. Ryania was a new one on Eve. That's another nat naturally occurring insecticide. It comes in at about 1,200 milligrams per kilogram, so more toxic than azadiractin. Uh, 
then there's nicotine. Nicotine is perfectly natural. You know where it comes from. It comes from tobacco. It used to be sold as an insecticide. And guess what? It's LD50 is six and a half to 13 milligrams per kilogram. So just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. This is really nasty stuff and it's in its pure form. It used to be sold under the name of Blackleaf 40. I can remember my grandfather had a bottle of it down in his basement somewhere and it had skull and crossbones all over it and for good reason. It's not only is it orally toxic, but I think it's absorbed pretty rapidly through your skin. You know what a small dose does to you if you were ever a teenage boy and tried smoking a cigar for the first time. Uh, so for some fungicides and others, febuconazole, that's the uh, bio-advanced product. That's a, in excess of three grams per kilogram. Mycobutanol, butanil, excuse me, that's uh, immunox. That's in the same category, two grams or more per kilogram. Uh, Man's 8, Mancozab, uh, about 3.2 grams per kilogram. Chlorothalonil, which is daconil, is better than 10 grams per kilogram. I think that's largely due to the fact that the stuff is almost entirely insoluble in water, maybe even in digestive fluids. There is an asterisk there because uh, there's more to that than just this LD50 figure. And the same applies to trifurine, which is the old fungidex, which may still be around on some products. That's about 16 grams per kilogram. But again, there's a, there's a different hazard associated with that. So the, these fungicides, at least the ones I've listed, are less toxic than the insecticide. And that's partially due to the fact that we are much more different from a fungus than we are from an insect biologically. And it's, it's easier to find agents that will selectively kill fungi as opposed to things that will selectively affect insects without affecting us. Some things around the house, just for perspective. Caffeine comes in at about 150 to 200 milligrams per kilogram. So there you are. Ethanol, uh, otherwise known as vodka, gin, whiskey, you name it. Uh, seven to 10 grams per kilogram. You can drink yourself to death if you are so inclined. Uh, aspirin, it's about 200 milligrams per kilogram. And you could say that's a stand in for just about everything in your medicine cabinet, including all your prescription drugs. They would all be toxic to excess. Only the dose makes the poison. Uh, sodium chloride, table salt, uh, 3.75 grams per kilogram. Glucose, a simple form of sugar, 30 grams per kilogram. So when properly viewed, everything is lewd, as one man said. Almost anything can be toxic to excess. And also around our house, and maybe without even thinking about it, you probably have things like chlorine, bleach, ammonia, toilet bowl cleaners, so forth, all of which are pretty hazardous, hazardous in their own right, but somehow don't bring up the same emotions as some of the garden chemicals. So thinking about dilution, suppose we wanted to kill ourselves with uh, tebuconazole. Notice that I had Bayer Advance and scratched it out because Bayer sold out their products and they're only known as BioAdvance. So BioAdvance disease control, disease control for roses and flowers. That's 2.9% tebuconazole. That means there are roughly 2.9 grams and 100 milliliters of the, of the stuff in the bottle. That's assuming that it's one gram per milliliter. That's an assumption. That's what water is. That means there'd be 29 milligrams in a milliliter of this. The dilution rate is a tablespoon and a half per gallon. So call that 22 milliliters in a gallon. That works out to 638 milligrams in a gallon of diluted spray. And if the LD50 is at least three grams per kilogram or 3,000 milligrams. That's oral in a rat. And assuming you're talking about an 80 kilogram person, that's 176 pounds. Not in my dreams, am I even close to that? Uh, <laughs> 80 kilograms times 3,000 milligrams per kilogram means you would, the lethal dose would be at least 240 grams. To get 240 grams in diluted spray, 
you divide 240 by 6.638 grams per gallon, works out to 376 gallons of diluted spray. So in other words, this stuff diluted is not a lethal poison, at least by mouth. However, and our butt, whichever you prefer, LD50 is not the minimum toxic concentration. There can be harmful effects at amounts that are considerably smaller. And depending on how you encounter it, you could get things like rashes, you could have breathing irritation, you could have eye irritation, and all of this is possible with much, much less material. LD50 does not consider long-term effects. And this includes things like carcinogenicity, you know, ability to cause cancer, mutagenicity, causing birth defects, say if someone who was pregnant. Uh, LD50 is just what it takes to kill something straight away. It does not consider, you know, what would happen if you're exposed to something over and over again over a period of time. I think we can stipulate that adults are not going to swallow this stuff either intentionally or accidentally. But there are other routes of exposure. Most significantly, it's contact with the skin. We can call that dermal or contact with our eyes. And also, we have to be concerned with uh, inhalation of material when we're spraying. Now, before we go on, I want to talk about sources of information on the products that we use. Number one, the label. And most importantly, the label. Read the label and act accordingly. Read the front label and the back label. Now here's one of Steve's pictures. These are older products that you probably are not gonna see looking exactly like this on the shelf, but th there's the front label and we'll talk about what you see on it. The front label, you'll see the trade name, the name of the product. You'll see what the usage is, what, is, what it's intended for, You'll see what the active ingredient is, and the active ingredient will be given always by its generic name, and we'll talk about that in a moment. There'll be a signal word on the label. So what's in a name? Well, the trade name is the product name, and it'd be something like Bannermax, for instance. The generic name is the name of the active ingredient, and Bannermax is propiconazole. Now, sometimes some things are, are sold by the generic name, like malathion, for instance. I can never remember a special trade name on that. I would just see a bottle and say malathion 50% or something like that. Uh, some labels also include the, the actual chemical name or the IUPAC name, as we call it. That's, if you're really worried about that, that's International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And I'm not going to try and pronounce all that, but that translates into this structure, which as a chemist, I find much easier to parse than I do all of that business above there. But the whole idea of that fancy name is that you should, a chemist should be able to construct the structure from that name or from the structure be able to construct that name. And that's the last you'll hear me mention that. So here's a close up of a couple of the labels. So what I said, this is, Rose Pride Funginex, that's the product name. It's used for disease control, stops black spots, et cetera. Uh, the active degree is triferine, six and a half percent. The signal word on this is danger. We'll get to that. This other one, it's cut off, but it's immunox, and again, it says it's for cures and preventive diseases. And you can't really see it for the glare, but it says the active ingredient is mycobutanil, and then it does go through all the the proper chemical name, and then it's one and a half percent of that. And your signal word on this is caution. So signal words, let's go over those. Worst case is danger of poison with the skull and crossbones. That's something which is highly toxic, has an LD50 somewhere, well, not zero, but from near zero to 50 milligrams per kilogram. So the stuff that would really be hazardous to handle. There's danger, highly hazardous for some other reason, like you saw on the uh, Funginex label. And the label will describe what that hazard is and we'll get back to that specifically in a little bit. Warning is 
means something is moderately toxic or hazardous, the LV50 is in the range of 50 to 500 milligrams per kilogram. Caution is slightly toxic, uh, greater than 500. And there's another level of caution greater than 5,000. They don't usually make the distinction on that. They're both called caution, but they're the least toxic of these materials that require this, the signal words. And they're based on the active ingredient or other things in the, in the formulation, because sometimes there's more than one chemical in there that could be of concern besides the active ingredient. The back label will tell you what plants the product can be used for, what are the targeted pests, the mixing instructions, very important, how much to use, what incompatibilities there may be, have instructions for storage and disposal. It'll tell you how, when, and how often to use the product. We give information uh, for first aid or other emergency information like spills. And here's one for compass. And again, tells you what's, what's in it gives you the first aid, tells you what environmental hazards are, and that's in groundwater advisories. Those are certainly worth feeding. Uh, what the problems there might be, say in this case, moderate eye irritation, uh, safety recommendations, all stuff that should be read and heated. Sometimes it's almost like a book that's on the back. And, and this one, you know, you just sort of leaf through. The thing I don't like about these booklets is invariably they seem to get wet, stick together, and then useless. But <laughs> do, when you have a new container, uh, be sure you read and understand them. And this is for Funginex, and I, I'll take you off to what the problem is. It's dangerous because it causes irreversible eye damage. And that has nothing to do with its oral toxicity on an LD50, but it does tell you that there's a, a significant other hazard associated with this product. And here we see the, the danger signal word on here. What about triferene and chlorothalonil or daconil? Well, daconil is another one which causes severe eye irritation. So if you're using a product like that, it's very, very important to be sure that you have adequate eye protection, and we will be saying more about that. Uh, I also would mention that there is a, mostly a bidacanil in, in the form of a liquid suspension. Uh, it's also available if you get the on the rosemary or something as a powder, but because of its insolubility and to keep it suspended in water and to cover the leaf of a plant, it has to be milled to a very, very small particle size, which means it's very easy for particles like that to be airborne. So keep that in mind. I don't particularly care to handle that as a power. I would much rather handle it as a liquid suspension. Another source are safety data sheets, sometimes known as material data safety sheets. I think the word material has been officially dropped, but you might see it listed both ways. These are required for all of these chemical type products. I worked in a lab environment and we had to have notebooks with MSDSs in them for essentially everything we had in the lab. And believe me, it was a real test to be able to do that and keep that up to date. But they gave you additional or more detailed information beyond what's put on the labels of the materials that you're handling. handling. There's a website, and this is this is in the manual, so you don't need to write it down, greenbook.net, where you can find a lot of these. Or failing that, Google the product name plus safety data sheet, and it'll probably come up there if you can find it. Some things, however, when you're looking at these, is that they may be written to assume that you're handling a large quantity of material rather than, than a small amount of a bottle. They may think you're handling a drum in, a, in some kind of industrial or large scale ag uh, situation. And they tend to use technical language, which you might be familiar. And you can certainly contact me or anyone else that maybe has been in the chemical trade at some time to uh, interpret that. So we're gonna quickly point out some on an example. Here's a 
material safety data sheet for Bantam Axe. This actually is from a Canadian plant, but I don't know if this is really significant difference from what you would find on a US plant. So name of the product, Bantam Axe fungicide, gives registration numbers, gives a chemical class, which is worth knowing with fungicides, gives the active ingredient. So there's that whole chemical name, tells you what it's used for. There's a chemical abstracts number. Every compound that's published is assigned a registry number by a chemical abstracts service. I only mention that because uh, Dr. John Dickman, as I recall, used to used to work for the chemical abstract service. Uh, so what's in there? Well, is your, your propiconazole. Well, there's another ingredient, tetrahydrofurfural alcohol, part of the formulation that also merits inclusion on the sheet. So there's something about the hazards. We go through there, you get the first aid measures, you get the firefighting measures, which hopefully would never be necessary for the amounts of material we're handling. Uh, accidental release measures, it tells you what you should do if there is, is a spill, how to clean it up, what to do with it. Information on handling and storage. Uh, Exposure control, what they suggest for personal protective equipment. Again, assuming that you're probably handling a large amount of this. Physical and chemical properties, you probably wouldn't be concerned with. Stability and reactivity, it's nice to know that it's stable under normal use and storage. Keep away from heat, open flames and other ignition sources. Incompatibility with other materials, strong oxidizing materials, which you generally wouldn't have, except maybe chlorine bleach, and I don't think you would be mixing that. Uh, here is your toxicity information, your LD50 for ingestion on the skin, uh, concentrations inhaled, moderately irritating eye contact, skin contact non-irritating, not a sensitizer, no reproductive or developmental effects observed, no chronic or subchronic toxicity observed, and on carcinogenicity, they say it's not considered to be a carcinogen. Other components, so well, here's the alcohol. It tells you that it could cause central nervous effects, dizziness, or headache. Well, <laughs> ethanol will do that too, but it, it does tell you that. It tells you what organs might be affected. This is worth noticing, ecological information that says that in summary, that it's practically non-toxic to plants, birds, and insects, very toxic to aquatic life. So yeah, 0.85 parts per million of water will kill a trout, Not a, but it takes two and a half uh, grams per kilogram to kill a duck. So it's worth knowing if you live near a body of water, you have a koi pond, you want to keep the stuff away from it. Disposal. Other information. So as Ed McMahon used to say to Johnny Carson, everything you want to know about this product is in this, this safety data sheet. So it's, it's not a bad thing to be aware of for things that you're using or recommending. Okay, how do we protect ourselves? Our major concern, we decided a skin contact, right? It says the hash sign. Uh, it's especially true of the concentrated material. Only the dose makes the poison. The more concentrated it is, the more toxic it is. When a tablespoon per gallon is a 256-fold dilution. So diluted spray, most cases, one 256 of the concentration of the, of the material uh, would affect any potential hazard. Eye contact the same. You'd be much more concerned about the concentrates than you would be the diluted spray. But we don't really want to inhale the spray either, the spray mist coming out of our nozzles. So we want to use appropriate personal protective equipment, <clears throat> which means that no matter how hot and humid it is in the middle of July, uh, we don't want to go out and spray in tank top shorts and sandals. Sorry about that. On the other hand, we probably don't need to look like this. And I understand from a caption on this that underneath the uh, the freight wig and the mask, that may be Kitty Belinda's. I don't know if she's on here today or not. Uh, 
but but definitely even without the fright lady in the fringe, if you were out like that, it would probably scare the bejesus out of the, out of the neighbors. So it's probably more than would be necessary most of the time. So protect our skin. First of all, a long sleeve shirt. It's a good idea. Very good idea, in fact. Ditto long pants. A, a cap, maybe overhead. Maybe wear one outside anyway, just to keep the sun out of their eyes. And if it's a really hot, sticky day, I like to wear a sweatband. Why? Because if I sweat, it runs down on my eyes. My eyes start burning, and the first thing I want to do without thinking about it is rub my eyes to get it out of there. And if I have anything on my hands, actually on my gloves, uh, I, I don't want that in my eyes. So I'm not tempted to rub my eyes if I'm wearing a sweatband and that absorbs the sweat. Uh, gloves, very good idea. There are lots of gloves around. I tend to use and prefer these nitrile exam gloves that you get at the drugstore or wherever. Uh, I hope you can see that these are good enough for what we're using. They're, they're thin enough that you maintain your dexterity. If you have heavy duty neoprene gloves, you can be a, a little clumsy. And of course, the good thing about these is that when they're done or they get contaminated, you just toss them. Footwear gets a little complicated. You strongly, you want to wear socks just to cover that gap between the, the cup of your pants and whatever you're wearing in the way of shoes or boots. Then it's a question of what type. Well, leather is not advisable because if you spill something on leather, it's going to soak right in and you are never going to get it out. And besides a possible contact hazard you have, you've just uh, trashed a pair of shoes. So, and, you know, if they were old ones you could pray with, maybe, you know. And ladies, of course, no open toes. Uh, what else? Well, you don't really need knee-high rubber boots either for what we're doing. But uh, maybe ideally something like a, an LL bean or uh, a mud shoe, which is covered with rubber, that that would probably be ideal because if you get something on that, you could you could just hose it off and and they'd be clean, they'd be reusable. Now, talking about protecting our eyes. Uh, I'm not sure the chapter says this, but I really don't think if you're a contact lens user, it's maybe not a good idea to wear your contacts when you're when you're handling chemicals. And the reason why is that something should get in your eye with the contact in it. The material can get between the lens and your cornea, and that's just a bad place to have it. Uh, it just leads to delays in being able to wash it out. And so. If you use contacts, wear your glasses instead, or be sure you have some very good eye protection over, over your, your eyes if you're using contacts. Uh, glasses do provide some uh, good, decent protection, although they're open at the sides. So something with side shields will be good. You know, industrial safety glasses usually have them. If, if you don't need any kind of uh, lenses at all, I guess you could buy a generic pair of uh, safety glasses with side shields. Uh, otherwise, there are, there are plastic over glasses that you can get that have you know, uh, side shields or goggles are a possibility. Then you start looking a little more out of space, but they fit snugly, they would be good protection and, you know, for contacts or whatever. As I said, be very extra careful with triferine or chlorothalonil or anything which is else which might be labeled danger for eye irritation. And if you're using one of those, if you get something on your gloves, because I'm assuming you're wearing gloves when you're handling the concentrates, or you certainly should. If you get anything on it, be sure you get the gloves right off because again, you might be tempted to, that's, when my eyes start itching is when, when I'm in a situation like that, and I certainly don't want to uh, be touching anywhere near my eyes with contaminated gloves. So if that's the case, get them right off. And I already talked about the powders because they become airborne. 
<clears throat> now for inhalation hazards. We don't want airborne spray mist near our faces because we might inhale it. And we don't want to spray on a windy day. What about a light breeze? And I got to tell you about that. I live on the on the top of a hill. About the only time in the summer there's never a breeze. It's about 5:30 in the morning. And believe me, I can't roll out of bed, get ready to spray, and anything before the the breeze starts. So if there is a breeze, and I think we can stipulate there's a difference between a breeze and a wind, be sure to stay upwind from it, and so that the spray ends up on the plant, not on you. And be extra careful when spraying tall plants. When you raise the spray wand at shoulder height or higher, that's when it's more likely to be near your face and possibly inhale or in, in your eyes. Uh, or you could be like Clarence Rhodes and rig up a six foot long <laughs> spray wand so you could be farther away from the bushes when you had to reach high. But you know, when you have those big shrubs or climbers or if you live in the sunnier areas where even the hybrid trees get to be six feet tall, you know, be careful when you're trying to get to the top of those. And I like say it certainly applies to eye safety. Now we get into the somewhat touchy subject of masks and respirators, because if there is any chance of inhaling something, you probably ought to think about using a mask or a respirator. So the, these things on the, the left, I call a mask. The thing on the right, I call a respirator. Now we all know that masks and sometimes respirators have become everyday items over the last year or so. I don't want to belabor that or, or get into anything that might be considered remotely political, but masks certainly are effective in straining out microbial particles either coming into or out of us. And for the purpose of the chemicals, we're more concerned with inhaling them. We're not going to exhale them. So anything you see here is okay. If you're worried about spreading microbes, I could tell you that this respirator would not work because what I'm pointing to is an exhale valve. So there's no filtration on what you would exhale through this respirator. Only you have these cartridges which filter the, the air coming in. And I'll be sure you have the right device for the intended application because they're a mask of mask. And I hope you can see me, I have some props here. We have the uh, the homemade cloth, cloth mask that a lot of people put in a lot of hours making early on in the pandemic. And God bless every one of them who spent the time to do that, but the, they're not really ideal for either purpose. And then you have what's generally referred to as a surgical mask, which is this thin mask that you can buy. And these are not particularly rated for anything. The box, if you can see it, says droplets, pollen, dust, or smoke, but there's no official certification for any of that. And frankly, a thin one for this, I think would probably be more effective for something I would exhale rather than something I would inhale. Uh, I wouldn't want to use this for spraying purposes. Serve me well when I've been out grocery shopping and so forth, because at least I've managed not to get sick over the last uh, several months. But they call these surgical masks because the primary interest of a surgeon is to not infect the patient rather than, than vice versa. Then you get a little more sophisticated and you get something like this. This is a a KN95, and supposedly it comes off the same, probably comes off the same line as the N95s, which are certified for medical use. But again, this has no particular certification. And sometimes they refer to these as respirators as well as masks. It says it's suitable for particles such as dust, smoke, fog, and microorganisms. And it certainly is more of a filter than, the, than this mask because all you have to do is put it on, you'll discover it's a little harder to inhale through and you're not gonna suffocate in a minute or two. You get used to it and don't even notice it anymore. However, again, you know, this I think would be fine for dust. It might stop a little bit of mist 
but if you're really worried about mess, you, you want to get something which is properly certified and maybe maybe go to a respirator rather, rather than a mask. Organic vapors, none of these masks I showed you would stop those. If you're really worried about organic vapors, solvent vapors, a, re a proper re respirator is the way to go. If you're talking about particulates, you want to know what size in the, you know, a very fine dust. Can this catch it? Well, I don't know because there's no specification given. So if you're really concerned about this, you want to look for a mask of respirators that are industrial types and have industrial ratings from something like NIOSH, NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And you're more likely to find them in something like a hardware store perhaps than, than in, a, in a drug store or this came from Amazon, this came from the warehouse club, uh, you know, but to be sure you want something that has a proper rating and that may cost you a little more money. The other thing, and you might guess from the caps, it's a bit of a sore point with me. A mask or a respirator is absolutely useless if it doesn't make a snug fit around your nose and mouth because the air will take the path of least resistance and that path of least resistance is going to be that, that gap underneath your eyes. And that's the problem with these cloth masks is that they don't have any way to seal that. These are the, at least have this bendable metal piece in them so that you can get a snug fit around your nose. And then the elastic should be tight enough to make a snug fit around your mouth. Respirators, if you use them, they are sized. You have to get the right size. If it's too small or too big, it's not going to seal properly. And again, it's going to be basically useless. Nice thing about the respirator is the cartridges are replaceable, so they get contaminated. You can throw them away, replace them, or you can use them with different ones for different purposes. Like your cartridge for solid vapors may not be as good for particulates and vice versa, but they can be swapped out. So my final advice on this is do your research before you buy. So before and after you spray, follow the mixing instructions carefully. Don't over or, or underdose. Overdosing, all it's going to do is waste your material and it may hurt the plants. Underdosing might be ineffective and also can result in building up a re resistance on whatever it is you're treating for because the underdose will kill the most susceptible organisms and leave the ones that are partially resistant. And then that population will build up and the cycle repeats. And next thing you know, you end up with a population which is completely resistant. Don't combine incompatible materials. Your label should tip you off on that. Most things, if you want to combine an insecticide and a fungicide, it's perfectly okay. But I can think of one product Elliot, which is used for dyeing mildew that is not compatible with other materials. So you wouldn't mix anything with that or you're gonna have uh, at least probably a, a mess that would precipitate out or, or do something that would render useless. If you use herbicides, keep a separate sprayer for that. We don't want any tragedies for getting them mixed up and, and getting even a little bit of herbicides on our rose bushes. Don't mix more than you need. That usually means some experimentation, but usually at some point, you know how many gallons you need to cover your roses. You probably know that you need less at the beginning of the season after you prune than, than you do in high season later on in the year. Goes without saying, don't eat, drink, or smoke while you're mixing, using any of these chemicals. Be sure your sprayers are in good condition, that they're not going to leak on you or worse, crack open from the, the pressure if, they, if the tank is, a, is in poor condition for any reason. You want to properly dispose of leftovers and rinse the sprayer. Well, how do you dispose of the leftovers? I guess we'll get to that. Remove and wash your clothing, dispose of any disposable gloves you're using. If you're using non-disposable gloves, wash them too. Keep your children and pets out of the sprayed area until the spray dries. Uh, it's much less hazardous to be around sprayed 
plants when the spray is dry, it's adhering to the leaves or absorbed by the leaves and when it's wet and, and dripping. And it's not a bad idea after all of a sudden done to just hop in the shower and just in case there's anything anywhere on your skin that you want to wash off. So you also need to keep the chemicals safe. Keep them away from children, of course, that's keeping the children safe as well. And best advice for that is to lock them up, the chemicals, not the children. There are, hmm, there was supposed to be a picture coming up. Well, maybe later. There are four animals, enemies of chemical stability that you need to be aware of. Heat, light, oxygen, and time. Because time allows the oxygen, the light, and the heat to work on the ingredients in the in the product and degrade them. Well, Light is usually not a problem because almost anything nowadays comes in an opaque container. Oxygen, well, if you cap it right up, it's the amount of oxygen that's exposed to is limited. So heat is a primary problem. Uh, don't let, don't put them in a very hot place during the summer. You're just going to cook them, speed up the degradation. But over time, they'll, they'll all eventually go off and, and uh, need to be replaced if they haven't been used. So you want to store, store your chemicals in a cool, dark place and capped. And you don't want it, cool is not cold because if things are cold or even freeze, that can break down the formulations and then you spoiled your product. They might no longer mix properly with water to spray or be uneven in their concentration. And yes, here's a picture. This is Steve Shedd. And apparently it was outdoors, even though it has those nice greenery hanging over. So I, I hope it wasn't too hot there, but, but that shows this padlock shed. If you have a cool basement and something you can lock it up in, if you have children or excessively curious pets that like to climb on shelves, uh, that would be probably the best place to keep them. Don't repackage chemicals for sharing, hashtag. It's very tempting if you start buying some of the expensive stuff from Rose Mania that's very concentrated that you could never use in three lifetimes. So you want to share it with your friends. Well, problem with that is if that's illegal and unsafe to transfer to unlabeled or improperly labeled containers. You see on this slide, an improperly labeled container, it says rally. Great. I don't know what rally is off the top of my head. Moreover, I don't know what I what to use it for. I don't know how much of it to put in a gallon of water to spray. Yeah, I don't know how toxic it is, and I don't know anything else about it other than the name. Not good. Disposal. If you have excess diluted material, well, we said try not to mix more than needed. Don't store the excess because once it's diluted, it may break down faster. And there's also just that many more opportunities for accidents. <clears throat> don't pour it down storm drains, sinks, toilets, things like that. We don't want it to get into a municipal sewage system. If you have a septic system, you probably don't want it in that either. So what do you do? Good question. If I have a little bit of fungicide left, I have a big lilac bush, lilacs get powdery mildew, so I'll spray the rest of it on the on the lilac just to get rid of it. <clears throat> and if, if there's just a tiny bit or the rinsings and so forth, well, I don't can't think of anything better to do than I just pour it on the ground near the foundation of my house where I'm not growing anything and assuming that it will break down a reasonable time in the soil and <clears throat> excuse me a minute. Getting a little dry, break down in the soil and not migrate very far. If you have concentrates, you've used up a container of concentrate, you can you can rinse it a couple times and add it to your the, the, the small residue there. You can just 
rinse it and add the rinsings to your sprayer tank, use it as spray, then it's probably okay to recycle it, but don't reuse it <clears throat> or put it in the trash. If you have leftover unused material that you're not going to use anymore, uh, don't put that on the trash, but check and see if there's a hazardous material drop-off program uh, in your city or area that you can uh, get rid of it that way. <clears throat> Do not use or recommend restricted use products. There are some products that you need to be a licensed applicator to use. There's a list published by the EPA. On the right, I have one that's from Massachusetts from five years ago, and they get to be pretty long. Uh, the other thing to be aware of, especially if you live near a state line, is that what's legal in one state may not be legal in a neighboring state. So be, be aware of that. Uh, what about accidents? Well, a little bit of spray mist on your skin or a dribble out of the nozzle, especially on a glove, is nothing to get too alarmed about, so don't panic. If anything actually gets wet, take it off and wash the skin underneath. You're dealing with the, the concentrates, it's a more serious manner. Maybe maybe a drop of something if you wash it right off is, is no big deal, but if you have any kind of contamination of clothing, take that off and then wash or shower yourself <clears throat> uh, immediately, just interrupt what else you were doing until you, until you uh, attended to that. If you've had extensive skin contact or if any kind of symptoms develop, that's certainly the point where you want to seek medical advice or in any way uncertain about it, you wouldn't want to seek <clears throat> medical advice. If there's a spill of liquids, you, you use something like hashtag kitty litter, sawdust, there are products that are out to absorb oil spills, things of that sort to soak up as much of the liquid as possible. Then you, then you can uh, scoop that up, bag it up, and dispose of it properly, probably take it to your hazmat pickup. Uh, if if it's a powder, dry material, you you want to sleep it up, but you know be aware that that's going to probably get dust in the air. So you want some you want some good personal protective equipment for that. Certainly, that's one you would absolutely want to wear a mask, <clears throat> maybe even a face shield, <clears throat> and again bag that up and dispose of it. So you use the personal protective equipment. When you're advising newbies, first of all, do they have a problem? Have you explored the alternatives such as uh, cultural practices? But if, if that isn't going to work for them, would they use a pesticide? <coughs> and if they are, suggest the least possible, least toxic possible problem to try first before you go to something stronger. Tell them that insecticides and fungicides to an extent kill beneficial organisms as well as pests, hashtag. <clears throat> Tell them that if they are concerned with fungal diseases, that fungicides work best when applied prophylactically, that is, before you, you see symptoms of the disease and regularly, hashtag. <clears throat> And if that's unacceptable, then maybe they need to think about exactly what roses they want to grow and be directed toward types that are more resistant to disease. Recommend readily available consumer products from your big box stores and your garden centers. Don't don't tell somebody with five rose bushes that you know there's this really great product which is only $150 and will be enough to treat thousand roses several times a year. Okay, summary. Read the label, number one. Number two, know about your material, know how to find, find information about it. Number three, read the label. Number four, use appropriate personal protective equipment. Number five, read the label. 
Number six, store and dispose of the material properly. Number seven, read the label. Number eight, don't panic. Number nine, guess what it's gonna be? Nope, do what the label says. <clears throat> Number 10, and this relates to don't panicking, respect your chemicals, don't fear them. Chemists respect chemicals because we know that they can be hazardous and we use things that are far more dangerous really than, than anything we talked about here. And we survive to do chemistry another day. Uh, respecting them means we, we are aware of what potential hazards there are. We know how to handle them and we have an idea of what to do if something does go wrong. If we fear them, well, fear leads to nervousness. Nervousness leads to mistakes. Mistakes have consequences, was Yoda that told me all this. And consequences could be spills, other other problems that we really don't want. So if you fear them and if your hands are shaking holding the bottle, not good. Respect them. Know what they are. Know how to handle it. Know that things don't leap out of bottles to bite you. They're not rattlesnakes. But so hopefully this situation will never arrive. But I couldn't help putting this little rhyme in. A green little chemist on a green little day makes some green little chemicals in a green little way. The green little grasses now tenderly wave or the green little chemist's green little grave. So finally, as our friends across the pond were advised during the hostilities of the last century, keep calm and carry on. So thank you. And I guess it's time for some questions. I hope